We're really happy to have her here. One big round of applause, godless round of applause for Sarah Moorhead. All right, how are you guys doing today? It's Sunday morning and we all got together. That sounds a little familiar. It's Saturday. Is it Saturday? That's how long my week has been, guys. That's how long my week has been. Okay, my name is Sarah Moran. I'm the Executive Director of Recovering from Religion. Um, we're going to talk about a few things this morning. One is how Recovering from Religion got started, what we do, who we help, and why it matters. One of the questions we get from the secular community very regularly is what's the point? What do, you guys, what, what do you guys even do? It's kind of something that's hard for some people to understand. So when, we get done with, when I get done with today's talk, you'll be able to walk away from here and explain to people why we do what we do and why it matters so much to the secular community. So, how Recovering from Religion got started. Everybody know who that is? That is Dr. Daryl Ray. He wrote The God Virus. He's sitting right over here just to embarrass him for just a couple seconds. When he was on tour for the book, for the God virus, people were coming to him in 2009 and asking him if, other, if there were other people who were going through the same thing with their deconversion, struggling with their disbelief, struggling with the family issues, the fallout, all of that sort of thing. So what Daryl was able to do was start connecting them to one another. And what was so important about that is people frequently say to us, I thought I was the only one. I had no idea other people were going through this. So just organically, automatically, there was this community building in towns all over the country when he would give his talks for his book. As it grew, he realized the potential for this organization needed to be more structured, and we needed to move forward a little more assertively with being able to manage these groups. They were exploding in growth. So we got together and we, we put together the Recovering from Religion organization. We're now a 501c3 tax-exempt org. We have groups all over the country. We have groups in Canada, the UK, and Australia. Um, we have groups that want to start in South Africa, in Singapore. This is taking off. So what Recovering from Religion does? First and foremost, what started the organization was the idea of having face-to-face, in-person contact with people who understood what they were going through in their deconversion. This is so important. One of the things that religious communities like to do is pretend that everyone in the in-group is right and everyone in the out-group is wrong, and they make the out-group, the non-believers, so scary and so terrifying that people who are struggling with their disbelief don't know where to turn. They don't even know what to look up. All they've been told is secular means Satan, humanist means hell. So they look for a secular humanist organization. They're not going to go there. That's where the horrible people are. So what we do is we give them that transitional space with these groups that meet monthly for about two hours once a month, and they show up and they answer the question, how have you been negatively affected by religion? Now, we don't tell people how they've been negatively affected. Some people haven't. Some people don't need us, and that's fine. But many, many people have. And for that, this offers them concrete support. Well, as this got started with the local groups, we realized we couldn't possibly ever have enough local groups all over the world. There are people who are needing access to these resources. They might be literally the only one in their town. They're not alone in our community, but they're alone in their town. So where do they go from there? Well, one of the things that Daryl started that's a project of Recovering from Religion is the Secular Therapist Project. Has everybody here heard of the Secular Therapist Project? Raise your hand. <laughs> Round of applause, absolutely. So the Secular Therapist Project is a groundbreaking project. Nobody's ever done this before. And what it does is it's an anonymous database where clients can go into this database, put their information in, and they can find a therapist that has already committed to using evidence-based therapy in their practices. Now you may say, well, that's a given. Isn't that what they're supposed to do anyways? Yes, that is what they're supposed to do anyways, but they don't. Many, many times people come to us and say, I really felt like I needed therapy, but I went to my therapist and she told me to find another church. She told me to pray. She wanted to pray with me during therapy. These things are obviously ethical problems, but it's so common in our country that it happens all the time and people don't see it as a problem. It is. So now we have a resource, and just this month we announced that we've helped our 3,000th client find a therapist. Now we have a resource where people can go and they can know for a fact 
that they're going to be helped with their problem without being told they need to return to God, find another church, work with their minister, all those things that lead them right back into the faith they're trying to leave. So we also offer confidential online support. This is really important and goes back to the local groups that are not able to be everywhere all the time. We have a reasonably closeted group. We have a couple of them, actually. And these are just online general support pages um, on Facebook. They're set at a um, private security level, level so that their friends, their family, nobody sees they're in the group. Nobody sees the posts that they make. These are people that are closeted in, in some or all aspects of their life, and for many different reasons. They're able to communicate with people all over the world who are going through similar experiences. It's kind of a virtual meeting space all the time. It's tremendously valuable. We've also just started in the last six months, we have a Connected to Clergy page, um, which is for spouses of believing clergy members. So these spouses are starting to have doubts. These spouses are starting to walk away. And they can't tell their partners, they can't tell their husbands, usually, um, that this is a, a, a process that they're going through because they know the risks involved. They could lose everything. So it's a place for them to safely work on that, talk about it. Um, mixed marriage is another one. This one is not um, specifically to the connected to clergy. So this is anyone who's in a mixed marriage. Their partners have religious beliefs that they don't share. And it's a great place for them to commiserate. How do we raise our kids? You know, how do we, how do we negotiate religious holidays? Those kinds of things are much more common in that, in that group. Has everyone seen the video? Um, it came out about a month ago, and it was Justin Vollmer, the deaf um, pastor. Has anyone seen that video? He came out, somebody has, um, he came out as an atheist, and he's a well-known in the deaf community, he's a well-known internet pastor. And, and he does all of his sermons, he's 100% deaf, does all of his sermons in sign language, and very graciously um, puts subtitles for the rest of us who don't have his skills. Um, and, and he's a fantastic guy. So what we've started with him is a deaf and hard of hearing recovering from religion group online. This is already an isolated community because of their abilities and their differences and because the, the deaf and hard of hearing community can be very, very religious and is also very, very insular. This is a tremendous resource for them as well. We're really excited. Justin is actually going to be coming on board to start doing online meetings for the deaf and hard of hearing community um, to, to have their own recovering from religion meetings. It's incredibly unlikely that we'll ever be able to have enough people of that community in one room for a regular meeting. So this was our solution to it. We're very excited about that. And then the final one is preacher's kids. Um, many, many people come to recovering from religion and say, my parents are ministers, or my dad's a minister, or my dad's a deacon. Uh, my own grandparents were missionaries. I know how that goes. And it's a completely different community. It's a completely different mindset. And there's a whole lot of expectation. But man, those kids really question their beliefs. I think because they have the inside info on the disconnect between what's being said on the pulpit and what's happening at home, it's an interesting opportunity for them to reconsider the role of religion in their life. And that's something that we offer here with giving them a place to talk about that. We also have Living After Faith. It's a podcast, it's our official podcast by Rich and Deanna Joy Lyons um, over in Seattle. And they offer a support podcast that specifically addresses all of the many issues from post-traumatic stress to surviving abuse to just simple things like negotiating new social networks and things like that. They interview people from in and outside of the secular community and they talk about the process of recovering from religion. These are our two upcoming projects. The first one is online workshops. We're going to be launching those in the next three to six months. These are going to be online workshops where people can register anonymously, they can maintain their anonymity if they need to, and we're going to focus initially on two specific topics. Recovering your relationships, so exploring how religious views and religious mindset has impacted your ability to make healthy relationships last. And the second one is Recovering Your Sexuality. And this one is very directly built off of Daryl Ray's second book um, called um, Sex and God. And I strongly encourage everybody to take a look at that. But this is going to help people really evaluate um, how religion has affected their sexual progress, their sexual growth, their sexual maturity, things like that that, you know, in the religious community, sex is bad from the get-go. So as people are leaving that, it's something that they need tools to help understand and move through. The final one that we're working on, and this one we're so excited about, it should be launching here in the next month. It's the Hotline Project. Has everyone here heard about the Hotline Project? <laughs> Woohoo! All right. Um, the Hotline Project, this one is so exciting. 
So we felt like we have local groups. They're meeting once a month. That's the in-person, face-to-face. It's wonderful. We have the online support. That's great. That's, you know, people who are on Facebook can really utilize that. We have a couple other avenues on Reddit and things like that. They're not as used as often, but they're there. We felt like there was another component missing. And we realized what it was when I started taking a look at the email contacts that we get and the phone messages that we get from people contacting us. And a couple things stood out to me. A huge number of calls that come in as more crisis calls. They're calling, they're emailing because they're in a panic. All of a sudden, in, in kind of, they've, they've been on this journey away from belief, and all of a sudden the switch flipped. And they went, I don't think I believe it anymore. I don't know what to do. I don't have anybody to talk to. I can't tell my minister. The one thing they want to do is find somebody right then. So they call us, and they leave very long voicemails, which is fine. That's great. We have no problem with that. Or they write to us, and they write pages and pages and pages of emails. And all of these things, they, they all basically say the same thing. The stories are very unique, but the theme is completely similar. They need somebody to talk to. A lot of these calls come in between 3 and 5 in the morning, and the voices on these calls are heartbreaking. You can hear it in their voice. You can hear the fear. You can hear the worry. They're saying, you know, I, I just finished this book, and I don't know what to think anymore, and I've got to talk to somebody. I'm, I can't talk to my wife. I, 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 you know, she'd leave me. So we realized that we needed to do the hotline project. The hotline project is going to be a toll-free 24-7 hotline with an integrated chat function on our website that will allow people real-time interaction with trained volunteers who are specifically trained to help them in their process of disbelief. Now, this is going to work for a whole spectrum of people, and we'll get to our spectrum here in a few minutes. But it's going to work for people who are just having doubts. They're still religious. They still believe in God. They still have their own dogma. But they're going to be able to call us and say, you know, my pastor's really hung up on this anti-gay thing, and I kind of think God didn't mean that. I don't know where else to look, though, because I know all those other people are going to hell. Where do I go? We're going to be able to help them answer that question. We're also going to be able to help the person who just decided they don't believe anymore, and they don't know what else to do, but they know they need to read, they want to research, they want to figure out what else is out there that they've been told is so scary. They don't a lot of times even know what to look up on Google. So we'll be able to answer their questions as well. Now, a couple things with this. When we announced that we were doing this project about a year ago, it hit the news, and everybody went nuts and said, Recovering from Religion is doing an atheist hotline. Not exactly. We are not an atheist deconversion organization. We are not atheist evangelicals. People call us. We give them the tools that they need to explore their own disbelief in their own time with their own support networks that we're happy to help them connect to, a lot of times they become atheists. That's not our fault. <laughs> so who Recovering from Religion helps? I've already touched on this just a little bit. When I first got involved with Recovering from Religion, and I was reading through these emails, and I was talking to all these wonderful people, and everybody was saying, well, these are all the things I went through. There seems to be kind of two camps of people. One group of people who says, you know, I just kind of decided it didn't work for me, and I just quit, and I didn't need it. And those people don't tend to need Recovering from Religion, and that's fine. But for the people that come to Recovering from Religion, we see a very similar pattern with their progress. So we came up with a spectrum of disbelief. And obviously, we've completely co-opted the uh, rainbow concept from the LGBT community. Thank you, guys. It was brilliant. Um, and we start with violet, which is polytheism. as the belief that all gods, all gods exist, all gods are powerful, all that stuff. We don't run into a whole lot of people with that. That's fine. We'll, we'll ignore the, tr the three-in-one trinity, right? We'll give them that. Um, so when we talk to people, most of the time they say, there's only one god. I only believe in one God. I'm a monotheist. OK, fine. So what we like to point out to them is that they're already on step two. They've already decided that there's a belief system they don't agree with, that they already have walked away from. And they don't see it that way, but it's fun to point it out, and it starts those gears turning. All we do with recovering from religion is we encourage them to move along the spectrum of disbelief so that they can get to the point that their day-to-day -day life is not governed by the shame and guilt of their religious viewpoint, that they can get to the point that they don't feel like they have to write a check every single month to stay out of hell. If we can get them to that point, we've done our job. 
Now, because of that, that means many people will come to us and they'll leave saying they're spiritual but not religious, or they believe there's a God and they don't think God really cares that much. It's just, it's there. And that's fine with us. That's completely fine. If they're able to go through their day-to-day life and they don't feel the impact of religion navigating their every choice, we feel like that's a success. Now, I will say the vast majority of the people who get to that usually come back a few months later and say, remember when I still believe that? So, yeah. Okay. So, why do I care? Why does it matter? Here's the thing. Their stories, all of these stories, these deconversion stories, they're my story, too. My history with the religious community goes back all the way several generations. My grandparents were missionaries. They were church planting missionaries, for anyone familiar with that term, um, which means that they took it upon themselves to travel throughout Central America and start churches, um, minister to everyone, save the savages, all those great things. I grew up in errant words Southern Baptist. I was an evangelical. I was very obnoxious. Anybody, anybody here with a Southern Baptist background? My people, all right. (laughs) So I firmly believed that I was put on this planet to save people, bring them to Christ. That was my job, um, jewels in the crown, the whole nine yards. Um, I believed that sin came from the fall of Adam. There was absolutely nothing I could do to change that. Baptism by immersion. Was anyone here sprinkled? Anybody? Raise your hand if you were sprinkled. I just want you to know it didn't count. Immersion only. (laughs) That's... That was it, full immersion, you know, so. And that was something that, you know, when I was younger and I would would find out from my friends that they'd been baptized and then they would tell me what happened at their baptism and I was so sad for them that, hey, they had such a lacking experience. The other one is salvation through the cross, which, you know, that's lingo, that doesn't really, I mean, it's, it's their lingo and that's fine, but when you think about what that actually means, that someone... I'm so awful, someone had to die in order for me to even have a passing chance and I could still screw it up. That's pretty deep. Lots and lots of rules, mostly about Sundays and girls because of sex. That's pretty much what it boils down to. So what I believed. When I became an adult, I had grown up my entire life in the Southern Baptist community with a Southern Baptist viewpoint and all of that. And Southern Baptists tend to be very rigid in their belief system, they're very patriarchal, all those things. I was actually going to find um, the text for Proverbs 31, but for any of you with any biblical knowledge, you know that's a really long, really boring verse, so I didn't do that. But this is kind of a bullet point of what it is, and I, I really strived every day to be a Proverbs 31 woman. And what that meant is you were supposed to get up before, while it was still dark outside, you were supposed to stay up all day and do all of these things. You're supposed to run your own business. You're supposed to make your own clothes. Your children are supposed to be perfect. Your house is supposed to be perfect. There's a reason that these women take so many antidepressants. It's not possible. I believe that God would bring me the husband that he chose for me. Now, this is a key point because this is how most women are raised in the Southern Baptist Church. The, the idea that God is going to bring you a spouse takes your decision out of it entirely and also removes any window to decide if that spouse would be a good fit. Well, God decided I needed a spouse who was a promise-keeping husband. Anyone here familiar with promise keepers? Remember that? I think they're still around, but, but okay. I dated myself there a little bit. But um, So I, God found for me a promise-keeping husband um, who took very literally the idea that I was to be submissive to him and subservient to him, and increasingly over the years became very violent. I believed my, my life was not mine to control. I was at the, um, under the headship of my husband, who was under the headship of the church, and our church had no problem with condoning um, correction in, in spousal relationships and that sort of thing. Um, very quickly, though, if you guys just yell it out, um, when I'm describing all of this, do you think I grew up in a small town? Like, yeah? Yeah. I grew up in Houston. This is a mega church. And that's a really important point. I think a lot of us get the idea that these very restrictive viewpoints are confined to these very small towns, and they're not. These, these um, messages, these, uh, this indoctrination is happening all over the country in megachurches everywhere. And I want that to be something you guys take away. You know, it's, they don't stand there and, and say this stuff outright, but when you peel away the layers, this is the message that they're sending to everyone. 
I believe that everything that happens is God's will, which is a really good way to teach martyrdom and helplessness. And you have no idea how to control the situation because you know if you control it, you're going against God, and I can't control it anyways, and so I have no choice but to just ride along and let it happen. So what I studied, in addition to the Bible, um, I studied a book called Created to Be His Helpmeet by the Pearls. They're also the authors of a spectacular tome called To Train of Your Child, which has been linked to a whole lot of death in children by um, violence and abuse. Um, Ephesians 5.22.24, this verse was one that I had a plaque on my wall at home, and I read it constantly um, because it was a constant reminder to me of the expectation um, in our church, in our household that sort of thing, and I'll let you guys read it. The one that that really stuck out to me when I was putting this together, and I remember having this viewpoint, the truth is I'm no more qualified to head my household than I was to receive salvation from God. That sums up the worthlessness of women in the religious community, of inerrant word religious communities, perfectly. You're, You're that much of a piece of crap. So what happened? Obviously, um, I'm not at that viewpoint anymore, and I don't have that marriage anymore, and I don't have that life anymore, so something changed. My husband had been increasingly aggressive towards me, and it had been going on for many years. For whatever reason, mostly because of the indoctrination, this was something I had resigned myself to. It was what God wanted for me. I had to suffer now so that I could have my rewards in heaven. You know, God never gives you anything you can't handle, yada, 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 whatever. Well, one day, um, he got angry with my daughter, my oldest daughter, and she was about 11 at the time. And whatever it was, he's de- he had decided very recently that she was of the age that she needed to be completely obedient. There was no more room for childish error and all that stuff. And he got very angry, and he picked her up, and he literally just threw her into a wall. And for whatever reason, all of these years of coming after me, I was okay with, in a sense. But that was the moment that I went, okay, we're done. I can't do that anymore. You can't go after my kids. Thank you. But it was not as easy as it sounds. So I had him leave. It was the one and only time that I think I convinced him I would actually press charges. Any other time that the police had been involved, of course, it didn't work out that way because I knew better. Um, I thought I did. So he left, and I had no support. Single-income family, the single income just left, and he's sure as hell not going to help me out anymore. So I went to my church, the church that we had been tithing without ceasing our entire membership, the church where we volunteered. I was an Awanas teacher. I taught Sunday school. We were incredibly involved in so many facets of this church. And we were broke. I mean, we were, you know, he was a seasonal worker. This was, it wasn't like we could afford any of it. And I went to the church, and I went to the Benevolence Committee. Now, the Benevolence Committee, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, in our church at least, is a group of men, of course, who are tasked with the job of deciding how to financially help members in need. Well, that seems awesome. It's what Jesus would do, right? So I went to the Benevolence Committee, and I said, this is what's happened, and I need your help. I didn't say to call the police. They didn't ask if we were okay and if Child Protective Services was involved. They didn't, there was no focus on all that. What they said was, and I, I, to be very clear, I asked them for $600. I needed to pay my rent, and I needed to get some food. What they said was, we got to pray about it. We need, to, we need to see if this is something Jesus is okay with. Well, it turned out Jesus was not okay with it. They got word from Jesus that their money would be better spent elsewhere. And I didn't realize at the time what was going on. I leave, I was so upset. I was crying. I wasn't paying attention to where I was going. And they had these big glass doors. And and I go and I'm pushing out of the glass door and I kind of run into a guy. I wasn't paying any attention. And and I realize, and I apologize, I'm so sorry, and I'm wiping my tears and everything. And I kept going. And then all of a sudden I realized he was putting glass etching on the doors, these massive, beautiful doors all over the church. I'm betting that cost a little more than $600. Jesus was totally cool with glass etching, but I needed to go to marital counseling to learn how to be a better wife before they would give me a dime. That was not the moment I became an atheist, but that was the moment the crack started. I realized I couldn't get any help from them. I didn't know what to do. I had very little support. I had very little community because all of my community was in this church. 
my childcare was there, my friends were there, I thought. Everybody was there. A few days later, I get a knock at my back door. The gentleman who answered the door, I knew him. He's lived in my neighborhood. In fact, he lived just catty corner behind our house across the alleyway. Um, and I prayed for them constantly. That's how I knew who they were. <laughs> um, it was him and his roommate. He had a male roommate. And, um, and they, were, they were sweet guys, but there was obviously something off about them. So I prayed constantly and kept our distance and made sure my children knew to stay away from their yard and all those things. And they had a flag they flew that had a, a star on it with a circle. And they did these like things with their friends where they're standing in a circle around a fire and chanting. It was just creepy and satanic and everything was horrible. But, you know, nice guys. You can't fault them. So that's who came to my back door. And I answer it, and he had a casserole. And he said, I know you've been going through a lot, and I've noticed your husband's gone, and I want you to know if you need any help or if you need somebody to watch the kids, I'll be here. Well, that was kind of a shock. I didn't really know what to do with that. So as our relationship grew, I started to talk to them more, and these were just delightfully patient, kind people who put up with so many ridiculous questions for me, like, I don't understand why you worship Gaia when you know you're going to hell. Why would you do that? <laughs> and the first time that they kissed in front of me blew my mind. I didn't, I, I didn't even know what to do with it. And they'd been in a committed relationship for many, many years. They've both passed away from AIDS now. It's, it, it was very, very sad. But these were the people who said, regardless of what bigotry you encompass, we'll just be nice. We'll entertain your stupid questions. We'll watch your kids so you can go to the grocery store. We'll give you 20 bucks because you need gas. That, that was these people. And contrast that with the reaction of my church. So that started the gears turning. That started, because now I have to research. I have to find out, okay, these people are so amazing. God doesn't really mean they need to go to hell. So I started moving along my own spectrum of disbelief. Maybe all religions are valid. That must be it. God, God's bigger than religion. We just, we're humans. We pick our own religion. And we're all just right. So these guys are fine. They're going to heaven. It's fine. Little by little, I started moving along this process. So finally, I started stumbling into other areas of the internet that were not approved by my church. Internet's awesome. <laughs> and I started looking for books to read that would help me understand. I knew I had to be the only person. There was nobody in my church who had ever lost faith, ever, ever, ever. Um, we were homeschoolers, we still are, talk to me about that later. Anyways, um, <laughs> but our homeschooling community had heard through the grapevine, I no longer had my husband with me, and we were no longer going to our church. Both of those things were an absolute suicide situation for my kids, for their friendships, for their connections, for me as well. So I'm just desperately trying to look for resources. And I found a book, and you guys may have heard of it, um, it's called Godless. And I'm reading this book about a preacher, a preacher who devoted his whole life existence to praising God, and he ended up thinking it was crap. That was kind of cool. I started realizing that there were atheist and secular groups in my community. I remember watching them on, and this was way before Facebook, for those of you who don't remember those days, but um, <laughs> I remember watching them on their little, their little meetup groups way before meetup too, but anyways, and I would watch their conversations, I think it was Yahoo groups, and I was a part of it, and I would just watch, but I would never say anything, and I would read all this, and I just thought, but they sound so nice. I don't, I don't know what to do. <laughs> but I felt so alone. The reason all of that matters is because when I came into recovering from religion, the one thing that has motivated me and still motivates me now is I wanna make sure that every single person going through that process knows they're not alone. They can find a group, they can find us online, they can find some friends, they can hear a friendly voice, they can anonymously reach out. It's not scary, we're not horrible, we're here for them. And that's what's important to me, that's what motivates me, and that's why I'm a part of this organization. So, how does this happen over and over and over again? Well, one thing really important, in order to convince people of something pretty awful, like, this process is, 
um, we have to start with a vulnerable population. Does anybody know, and just yell it out, there are two of the most vulnerable populations that religions put most of their money and their resources into evangelizing? Kids is one. Next one. Prisoners. Who said prisoners? You win. Bonus. Okay. Prisons and children. Okay. And there's, there's two ways they do it. With children, they have to make sure they know they're broken from the beginning. They start them off already incapable of developing their own self-esteem without external help, and they just take care of it from the beginning. Helps, it, it, it really perpetuates the whole process very, very simply. With the prisons, they go in and say, see what you did without God. See how horrible you are, now I have the fix. And it makes it even worse when the probation system and everything else has it built in that the easy ticket out is to prove that you found Jesus somehow behind the curtain. I'm not sure. So what are the rules to be a part of this process and a part of this mindset? They're very simple. You're broken. You're lost. You're unworthy. You have a hole in your heart. And who can fill it? All right. You've been to church. Okay. (laughs) Take a look at this image. Now, I found this on a religious website, and they see it as inspiring and wonderful and and all these great things. Can anybody see um, what's on his hands, on his wrists? Shackles. I find it interesting how we see this image and the shackles and how they see it. There's a little bit of a difference there. Okay. So in all of this, I wanted to answer the question, how the hell do they do it? If I went up to you guys right now and I said, I have something for you, okay? Now, the thing is, I'm going to save you for all of eternity. There's only a few catches. You are a completely worthless piece of shit, okay? And if you argue with me, then you're being worldly. I just need you to know that. And also, please start writing me checks every week. And if you don't, really scary things are going to happen to you. Um, Most of you would not be very interested, unfortunately. I mean, for me, but... um, (laughs) So how do they do it? And I I really wanted to know what's the thought process behind this. Because obviously with children, they kind of get an in. They start them from very young. It's indoctrination, programming. We get that. That's not too confusing. But what about the college kids? What about the, the adults who all of a sudden decide they've found Jesus and get more and more and more fundamentalist every step of the way? How do they do this? So I started doing some research, and I came across Dr. Robert J. Lifton. And he wrote a really awesome book called Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism. And I'm not going to go through all of that right now, but I encourage you to get the book and read it. It's really amazing. So what he did was he studied POW prisoners. Now, he was just looking at how the the process of thought control happens. But as I was doing my research, I realized what they're doing in these religious communities is thought control. So is there a connection there? Do Do they do anything similar? Well, let's take a look. There are eight methods of coercive persuasion and thought reform. One is environmental control, the control of information and communication. Well, 1 Timothy 4.16, keep a close watch on yourself and and on your teachings. Stay true to what is right, and God will save you and those who hear you. Now, a lot of preachers tell their, their congregants what they can watch, what they can't, what kind of music they're allowed to listen to. What's the latest music that's satanic? What's the latest music that's influencing their children? Perfect example of environmental control. They create megachurch communities where they can do all of their shopping, all of their social networking, all of their free time. Everything is built into these communities. That's environmental control. They know that they can't walk away because they, walk, they lose everything. Two, mystical manipulation. This one, I, I literally laughed out loud when I, when I saw this. It was, it was just so blatant. Um, the manip- manipulation of experiences appearing spontaneous, but were planned and orchestrated. If anyone has been to a revival or any sort of a faith healing experience or even just a, a, a really um, enthusiastic church where they believe in spontaneous healings or talking in tongues or anything like that, that is exactly what happens every step of the way. And of course, the faith healers and all that. Demand for purity. The world is viewed as black and white. Group members are pressured to conform and strive for perfection. This is really important. Black and white thinking is a hallmark of dysfunctional behavior, but they see it as godly. So they do something very simple. They just say everything we do is godly, everything they do is not. Your choice. Confession. I thought this picture was really sad, by the way. It just, that's not a happy kid. Anyways. Sins as defined by the group are confessed either to a personal monitor or publicly to the group. 
Obviously, that's pretty self-explanatory for almost every religion. Sacred science, the group's doctrine or ideology is considered to be the ultimate truth beyond all questioning or dispute. Um, there was a documentary that came out recently, um, and this gentleman said this. Um, it's Pastor Peter LaRuffa. He said, if somewhere in the Bible I find a passage that said two plus two equals five, I would not question what I am reading. I would believe it, accept it as true, and work it out to understand it. He said, he, he's alive right now. Like, this isn't hundreds of years ago. He believes this right now, and he's teaching people to believe that way, and he is by far not the only one. This is an ex excellent example of the sacred science. And it's why, by the way, when you're talking to people who have these viewpoints, they're starting from the presupposition that they're already right. They're not interested in the alternative. Loading the language. The group interprets or uses words and phrases in new ways that the outside world doesn't understand. This one's really important for two things. One, it creates their own community and reinforces the in-group, out-group mentality. Okay, fine. Here's what also it does. When people leave that religious community, they still have that language. They still have those definitions. So those things, as benign as it sounds, become trigger issues. When we talk to them as the secular community and we're talking to people who are religious and we accidentally use these words, and, and I just put more of the positive ones on there, but words like atheist, words like secular, those things, when I said secular means Satan and humanist means hell, that is a phrase directly from one of my ministers growing up. I heard it over and over and over again. It's still to this day I can hear his voice saying it. Now, I know because of my own experiences that secular doesn't mean Satan and humanist doesn't mean hell. But the point is, when we're working with people and communicating with people who have these viewpoints, that's their thought process. They hear that one word, and then it reminds them of their pastor. It brings them right back to that indoctrination. Doctrine over person. Personal experiences are subordinated to the sacred science. Any contrary experiences are denied or reinterpreted to fit the group's belief. Um, this is a good one. You know, the gay agenda is one of their famous ones that they put out there. Anything about evolution versus creationism, things like that. Um, even though they will have good positive experiences, even though they go to a class where a professor teaches them what evolution really is, and I had this experience, um, they're still in the back of their mind going, oh, I just gotta go through this and get the A because he's obviously wrong. I reinterpreted everything. People reinterpret everything so that it fits that worldview. Dispensing of existence. The group has the prerogative to decide who exists and who doesn't. And I don't mean in the terms of life and death necessarily, what I'm, although they are dispensing that when they say you get to go to heaven and you get to go to hell. Or they back off of it a little and they say, well, it's not my job to judge. But God says... That's a fun one. The other way they do this is through social isolation. And this is another reason that people come to us and need our help. Because if they tell their spouse, or their spouse finds out they've been reading these books, or they confide in their minister, or they talk to their adult children, or they talk to their siblings, they're actually taught, the religious community is actually taught, that if you cleave away from the unbeliever now, your reward is in heaven. That's why you see people like in Westboro Church when they can just disown their kids and it's done and it's over. And everybody looks at that and says, oh my God, that's so horrible. I'm so glad it's such a tiny little cold and it's not happening to more people. It is. It happens to people all the time. There's a place, in case you guys don't know, if you ever run into anyone in this situation, there's a place on Reddit called Atheist Havens and it's for teenagers who've been kicked out because of their religious beliefs. And it helps them find a couch to sleep on. It helps them get connected to places that can help them. But that's not the only one. There's a lot of them out there. And we get calls like this all the time as well. So how do they get this message across? Well, I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can. I'm only going to read the, uh, the top version, which is what Dr. Lifton um, put together in his book. When he did this research, he wanted to find out how do POWs come out of their experience so supportive of the message that they were originally taught by our government not to agree with. Identity assault, you are bad, there is no gray area. Self-betrayal, agree with me that you are bad and you are not in control. Now, I'll let you guys look through the religious version, but I'm sure that just hearing that, you can automatically see how common and how similar that is between the two. Introducing the possibility of salvation. This is his words, and he wasn't talking about religion. Am I done? Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Damn it. 
Okay, I'll try to go through here. Okay, so if you want more information about this, I'm gonna skip through. Um, there we go. Okay, quick lesson in personal boundaries, and this is really important. Um, when people are um, learning about their religious beliefs or the negative impact of their religious beliefs, one of the things they realize is that their own boundaries were not something that was respected. Um, they're taught that no matter what stage of boundaries people are in, and we have self, family, friends, acquaintances, and then kind of everyone else, they're taught that no matter what, what step everyone is in, God is everywhere. That teaches them that their own rights don't matter, they don't have the ability to say no, it perpetuates codependency. Now, that was actually several of my slides coming up, but for the sake of not making JT insane, we're gonna blow through a few of those here. Um, Okay, so really quickly, um, resources that we rec recommend. We have a website, um, re recoveringfromreligion.org. You can go to recommended readings and recommended resources. We have a ton of things. Both of Daryl's books are up there. These are the other books I highly recommend. All of these are on the recommended reading. Um, and these are the ones we recommend the most to absolutely everyone. How to get involved. We're a 501c3 organization. If you support what we're doing, if you've heard what I've said today and you wanna get involved, one thing you can do is make a tax exempt donation. We really appreciate your financial support and we cannot do it without you. Two is to go to our website and volunteer. Um, we need volunteers, we will never have enough and we would love to have you on board, so please do that. Finally, change is a process, not an event. So here's the, here's the, here's the crux of all of this. From the earliest age, Religion will teach you that you are broken and you are doomed by your own creator who formed you in your womb. This is the result of, iner of inerrant belief. These stories, your story, my story, their story, these are the consequences of faith. All of this is why we, the secular community, need recovering from religion. Thank you. Thanks. I have no idea how to do any of that. <laughs>